Hello, Peter. Welcome to the Happy Healthy Caregiver Podcast. It's been way too long, Elizabeth. So thank you for having me here. It's been way too long. In fact, I was thinking that like you have not probably known this, Peter, but you've kind of been walking side by side with me throughout this caregiving season of mine. And I literally just grabbed this out of my closet. Um, and for those on the video, you can see it's the caregiver's prayer. Oh, the caregiver's prayer. <laughs> from your Hope for Caregiver, because this spoke to me and I'm looking at it and it it was copyrighted 2014. I know it's from your your book, one of your books, which I also have and have read. Um, and, and this this landed on me like probably when I first even realized that I was a caregiver. Like at first I just thought I was a daughter, you know, caring for mom. But uh, anyway, it's been sitting in my closet. Like it's posted. I have this like vision board and then I have Peter's caregiver's prayer right underneath that. So well, that is very gracious of you. I, I remember when writing that because I was struggling with how to pray for myself. And, you know, what do you, what do you pray for? You know, I mean, what am I asking the Almighty for? Am I asking for Gracie's legs to grow back? I mean, what am I doing here? And and I really thought, okay, is the goal for me to get out of this, feel better, or is this the goal for me to to be better in this? And and that's when all of this started. And um, uh, that book, uh, yeah, that it came out a long time ago. I've got uh, my newest one is they're just one minute chapters. The, the, I, what I did is I did that book, and then I did Seven Caregiver Landmines, and then I did my newest one. It's called A Minute for Caregivers, When Every Day Feels Like Monday. And they're getting, I mean, the the, the stuff I'm writing getting shorter. Pretty soon it's going to be a bumper sticker for caregivers. There you go. You can join Matthew McConaughey, his book Green Lights. He's always like bumper sticker, like that. You can totally. All right, all right, all right. right. Yeah, there's totally a need for a care, more caregiving bumper stickers out there. Um, well, I. I when I, we you, don't have time, you know this. I, I watch your stuff and I look at your stuff and, you know, we just don't have the time to sit down and go through this academic exercise. We need somebody to deposit stuff like what you do just in time for right now. Here we go. Not, not for next week, not for, you know, not even for tomorrow, for today, as the old hymn says, spring for today, bright hope for tomorrow. So yeah, thank yeah. you for that. That is very and, kind of you. And we hope that that stuff lands on people when they need it the most. And so what, on that note, we always kick off the show with a happy, healthy caregiver jar. This is a very homemade jar that, you know, I made one similar to my sister, but I have collected things that have spoken to me as a family caregiver and created a jar for my sister when we transitioned care of my mom from me to her. I just thought like I was giving her the the worst thing ever. Like, here you go. Here she, here she is. Take her away. And so I- Well, normally I see can't. Normally I see fruit in a jar like that. That's an old mason jar, isn't it? It is an old mason jar, yes. So, and people can make their own <laughs> jars. I've got these, uh, you know, available for folks. But so this is what your, your today's, let's see how this lands for us today, Peter. It says, nurtured, nourished people who love themselves are the delight of the universe. Um, and somebody named Melody Beatty, who's like an American self-help Author, author read that. So nurtured, nourished people who love themselves are the delight of the universe. Well, I, I don't, I have, I don't know the, the universe is a big place. So I don't know how much of a delight I am, but <laughs> I try to be nurtured and I try to be nourished. And uh, I am, um, I, I agree. I, one of the things that I say often is healthy caregivers make better caregivers. And uh, when we're not healthy, what good are we? You know, Gracie doesn't need me fat, broken, miserable. Yes. You know? I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not much good to her that way. And, and so that's that's the whole point of everything I do is how do we stay healthy while taking care of somebody who is not? And healthy is not just having a good balanced diet. Healthy is a state of mind. And, and these are, I love what you said, the happy, healthy caregiver. I mean, you understand this. So, well, yeah. I'm striving right, Melody, for it. Thank you for that. People try to call me that. And I'm like, oh, no, no, that's like the goal. Like that's the the beacon that we're headed towards. Like I'm not claiming to be that. I'm a work in progress like everybody else. And, and uh, but yes, and you also have another thing that I remember you said, and I think I pulled it out and even made a quote about it. Like if you don't make time for wellness, you'll make, you'll 
make time for so illness. If you don't or, take time for stillness, you'll have to make time for illness. That's what it is. Yes. Yes. Thank you for that. That, because those are the kinds of things I think that we need to hear. And like, I was just leading a, a group yesterday and, and one of the questions or the, it was about self-care strategies for working family caregivers. And they were talking about this whole thing about carving out time for yourself. And the person just like felt like what they wanted and what they needed, like didn't, how do they, how do they know that they have value in just being a human being themselves? Like, yes, we have value as caregivers. Like, to your point, like if you don't take care of yourself, you're not going to be any good to to Gracie, who who is your spouse that you care for. But as human beings that God put on this earth, like we also are just valuable of love and care just as humans. How do you get caregivers well, to kind of understand that? Like it's just, it's not just about. I, well, I think that the, the thing is we have a conversation like this. When you say things, if you don't take time for illness, you're going to make time for illness. This is not something that's up to debate. You can argue with me all you want, I say to folks, but you try it. You try not taking time for stillness and see how long that lasts. And, um, you know, my, my as I tell people who may have a different opinion about it, I said, well, my experience trumps your opinion. When you've been doing this for almost 40 years, you learn that this is these are not truths that all of a sudden I just wisely came up with. These are things that I had to learn the hard way. Everything I've learned, I've learned the hard way. I'm the crash test dummy of caregivers. And so, okay, there's a point. I'd love to tell you I was wise. I would love to tell you that I'm brilliant and think of these things. What it is is, Elizabeth, I'm just tired. And yeah. so when you're tired enough, you'll stop fighting these things. And so I think it's so important for each of us to take that time for stillness. I don't know what that looks like to you. It doesn't mean you have to sit in the chair and look at a wall. For me, I, I saddle up. I, we live in Montana. I saddle up a horse. And I'm not being still, but I, my, my heart is being still. There's nothing wrong with the inside of a man that the outside of a horse can't fix. Will Rogers said that. And then the other day, I was feeding the horses. I, I have a snowmobile that I put a little sled on, and I fill it up with hay to go feed the horses. And then I decided, you know what? I, I let everybody know where I was, made sure that if, if everybody was okay. And I said, I'm taking a ride. And I just went out on a ride by myself yeah. out here. We live way away from, we live 10 miles from a paved road. I could ride on a snowmobile for hours and not see another human being. Mm -hmm. And um, and so, because we're back up to National Forest. And and so I just went out there and just kind of settled my heart down. I mean, just, you know, I've got to do that. If, I, if I'm just a bundle of stress all the time, which I am enough as it is, then, you know, I'm, I'm going to burn. I was talking to my sister. Our dad has, um, I have four brothers and a sister. And our father has Parkinson's and he's pretty frail. And um, he's 89, and, my, and I said, well, when I get to be 89 and my sister stopped me, she said, oh, no, no, you're not going to make it. You're just going to flame out one day. Oh, no. <laughs> you're just going to. Oh, I think it muted. Oh, there we go. We're back on. It muted. Sorry, I got a text from someone. Um, I hate to do this on my phone. I normally do it on my computer, but every time I tried to log in on Zoom, it said, you need the update, call your IT support. And I'm like, <laughs> I am my IT support. What's the matter with you people? Yes. So, you're every, uh, but anyway, you're, so, uh, and you explain, I, like we, caregiving's we, we've happening. We've got to settle down. Hmm. We've yes. got to settle down. Yeah. My stillness, Peter, looks like getting outside. I'm with you. Like, I got to get outside in nature. Like, I can... I don't like myself when I'm trapped in the four walls for a, a long time. So it's just, uh, if it could be a 15 minute walk. It could be like listening to some music outside or just listening to nature, but it's outside is critical for me, like just getting out there and soaking up some mm -hmm. vitamin D. Um, but I think you do have to try on different things to kind of figure out what your stillness is. And that looks different for everybody. Um, and I know we kind of alluded to it a little bit, but for people who don't know you, Peter, like what, how did you get to be this, uh, what you call a crash test dummy of uh, in caregiver? <laughs> it starts with a lot of failure. Um, I, I got married to a woman who had a broken body. She had gotten hurt a couple of years before I met her, um, about 20 surgeries by that time that I could count. It's hard because to go back to some of those records, uh, this is back, she got hurt in 83. We got married in 86. And she had seasons where she was able to live well, I mean, you know, do, do pretty well, but she's always been hurt. She's always been disabled. Uh, it, it was a horrific car wreck. And mm. I talked to a lot of her providers now that 
that said there'll never be another case like her because at the time uh, they should have taken her leg, but they didn't. And they, the reason they didn't is because prosthetics just weren't where they are today. And in saving her legs, which eventually she ended up losing anyway, they condemned her to a life of orthopedic trauma. But that was the conventional wisdom. Her back started having problems. And then they fused her back over 20-something years ago. And the way they did it was to kind of pitch her forward just a little bit. Well, then she started going further and further and further. And then she was 45 degrees over. She had what they call flat back to her fendal curvature in her spine. And so of the 86 surgeries that she's had that I can count, um, we just had a two-month stretch at the University of Colorado Medical Center where they went in for a second time to straighten her spine back up, give her some more curvature. These are massive surgeries. And she's the first double amputee they've done this on. But, you know, Grace would be the first to tell you there are worse things than amputation. She has great prosthetic legs, but the rest of her is just an orthopedic train wreck. She lives with pain all the time. She has so many uh, mitigating things going on all the time. It's just, it's constant. There's, there's, uh, it's relentless with her. And so over the years, I've had to deal with, you know, all this stuff. She's had over 100 doctors treat her in 13 different hospitals. Um, seven different insurance companies and and all you just name it yeah. um, and and it doesn't it it doesn't show any signs of slowing down. That's why I look the way I look, Elizabeth. I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm only thirty years old. Um, <laughs> uh, you, you know, the, 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 don't the let this happen to somebody you love. This and, and, humor <laughs> is key. I know for I'm imagining that that's part of the how you've gotten this far, but that's kind of the question. It's like going through all of these things and knowing like there's maybe not an end in sight, like how, how are you still standing and how do, you know, what do you self-talk to yourself and what is your strategy for resilience? Like how, how can I have what he's having is basically what I'm asking. Well, uh, there's several things. One of them is uh, my faith is a big part of what I do. Uh, a pretty goofy sense of humor has kept me alive with this and also uh, recognizing, and it's taken a long time to understand this, but there is great beauty in the midst of this, that life is worth living. There there was this point where I realized that we're not going to get through this and then get on with our lives. This is our life. This is it. And I've been doing this since I was 22. So the question then becomes, okay, how am I going to live this life? What am I gonna? What, what am I gonna do? Am I just gonna just keep striving to get through this and just get through the day, or am I gonna be productive? I've written four books. I've written. I don't know. How many, I just finished a, an article this morning. I don't know how many published articles I've done. Over something over well over a hundred. I know uh, just in the last couple of years. Uh, I've uh, produced two CDs. I've written songs that other people have cut. I have done all these things while serving as a caregiver. I have done interviews. Elizabeth in the laundry room while cooking. I was, I remember talking to a reporter at NBC while I was cooking a roast and, and I've done all of this as a caregiver and I make no apologies for the dishes you hear clanking in the background because this is my life. That's real. And I've learned to adapt it. It's not a bad life, but it's a hard life. And, and I, the, many of the caregivers I see are just trying to endure till mama goes on to be with Jesus and then we can get on with our life. And I'm thinking, no, this is life right now, today. Yeah. You're not guaranteed anything tomorrow. And so what are we going to make it count for? And I decided some years ago I was going to make it count. But it started, and I opened up my new book with me trying to check myself into a mental institute mm. in Nashville. When we lived there, we lived there for many years. And I was exhausted. I'd had a surgery that had gone wrong, and I was worn out. Nobody knew how to take care of me. Nobody knew how to take care of Gracie. And I was sick, and I wasn't getting any sleep. And, and finally... I went over to this place, and I and I asked them if they took walk-ins, and they looked at me kind of funny. And I thought, you know, this is a mental health hospital. I mean, that's the question that gets the funny look is, do y'all take walk-ins? I mean, for heaven's sake. But I kept my mouth shut. I wasn't a smart aleck, and uh, it took a great deal of constraint on my part. And they took me back to this room that looked like early law and order interrogation room. Oh, wow. And, and I sat there, and this counselor came in and said, well, what brings you here today, Peter? And I, you ever just verbally vomit, Elizabeth? You just, just yeah. let it all out? Well, that's what I did. And 
and I let it all out. I mean, just everything. About, I don't know. Not an were, there hour. were there tears yeah. with that? Because my vomit would have a lot of oh, tears. Oh, te there was not with it. Yes. Okay, <laughs> there good. Tears. There was not. not. Yeah. And, and so I uh, can we say it's not on your show? Let's yes. <laughs> <laughs> and um, if if you're not a, if you're a caregiver who hasn't cleaned up snot, then you haven't been doing it long enough. Um, but it's uh, <laughs> that's what I say. Vomit's not pretty much. I get the trifecta, but it's um. I looked, I was kind of curious to what this counselor was going to say. I mean, here I am telling them I'm crazy. Please yeah. take me. And she looked at me and she said, very nice lady. And she said, well, we can't keep you here. And I was crestfallen. I said, well, why not? And I was arguing with her to admit me. To yeah. Her. <laughs> I need respite. Yes. I'm I desperate. really wanted somebody else to bring me meals. I wanted just a quiet place to sleep. <laughs> and I said, well, why not? Said, well, you're not crazy. And I said, well, you're going to put that in writing because there's some people who want to see that. And and she said, she said, no, you're not crazy, but you are burnt out. And she said, I give you some counselors to talk to. And she gave me a list and I took them. But, and I ended up going to one and all he wanted to do was give me medication. And I'm like, screw this. And I don't, that's, that's not going to help me. I, I, I need, I need understanding. Yeah. I you want to need... feel the feels, not numb them. Yeah. And I, and I, I don't, I don't need to. Uh, I just need understanding. It's one thing to suffer. It's another thing to suffer and be stupid. And I've turned, I, I've just turned that corner. I said, I'm tired of suffering stupidly. I'm tired of reacting. I want to learn to respond. Mm -hmm. And um, as I was leaving, she said, we, we've been giving out box lunches all day. And we got one left. It's tuna fish. You want it? Well, Elizabeth, I've never turned out a tuna fish sandwich in my entire life. <laughs> and, and that record remains intact. Not even when my best friend and I, Dexter James Glinsky II, we call him Wolf, he's a great American. Still, my, We've been friends since we were 12. And mom made us go over there and weed the garden for this lady in our hometown there in Anderson, South Carolina, up the road from you. And this lady was nuts. I mean, she was crazy with a capital K. And we we were out there weeding her garden, and she brought us in there, and she said, we got tuna fish. And so, of course, we're going to take tuna fish. I've never turned one down. And then he reaches for the blender. And, it, and I was like, what sorcery is this? And she pours all the stuff in the blender, just matches the blender, just matches it up. And Wolf and I are looking at this thing, and, and then she pours it out on this Pepperidge Farm-type bread where it's just kind of dripping. And we're, we're having to soldier through it while it's dripping down our elbows. So I will never turn out a tuna fish sandwich because that's the level that I sunk to. And as he asked me, <laughs> do you want a tuna fish sandwich? I kind of looked around for a blender just to make sure everything was okay. And he handed me this lunch. And then she looked at me and she said something. It changed my life. She said, I'd recommend a book for you to read, but you're the guy to write it. Ooh. And I, and I thought about that. I went out to my car and I, opened my sandwich up and ate it. It wasn't Pepperidge Farm type bread. So I, it was a solid piece of bread so I could eat the tuna with it and it wasn't blended up. And I thought, what would I say to other caregivers? And then I thought, what would I say to myself? And that's when I started writing because I wrote to myself okay. and everything I do on my podcast, on my broadcast, on my books, on my articles, I'm preaching to me. I am saying to me, what I feel like needs to be said to get me through the challenges that I deal with, to reorient my mind. And uh, there's a um, there, there's a, there's these principles that started coming after that, like take time for illness or make time for uh, take time for illness or make time for illness. I had to come to the understanding that my wife has a savior. I'm not that savior, you know, and I'm no good to her if I am thinking in this way. And that he deserves that the, the greatest asset he had is to keeping her life from going even further down a journey is me. Is you. In this sense. And so I have a responsibility of stewardship, not obligation. Because I think so many caregivers get lost in that fog of caregivers, I call it. Fear, obligation, and guilt. And, oh, I have to. I must. I need to. I'm supposed to. I should have. I should have. I should have. We should have all over ourselves. And that, that's got to stop. I have a stewardship responsibility. I didn't do this to Gracie. I can't undo it. But I can care for her to the best of my abilities in it. And the same thing I do with the fog. I mean, you guys, 
have fog down there in Georgia? Yeah. What is the first thing you do? You slow down. And you don't turn on your high beams at night. Why? Because the glare will come right back at you. Well, when you're a caregiver, you slow down and you don't turn on your high beams because you're not going to be able to see that far down the road. You're going to have to deal with right here and right now. That's it. And these are things that I started to do to help slow my own heart down and then to help point my fellow caregivers to safety to slow their heart down so they can come back away from that cliff. Let's get our breath. Let's take a knee if we have to. And then let's start thinking through this thing. Again, it's one thing to suffer. It's another thing to suffer and be stupid. And I refuse to do that anymore. And I want to help as many of my fellow caregivers as I possibly can to back away from that. And let's think through this. Yeah. Let's think through these decisions. I can't tell you how to take care of your family any more than you tell me how to get, take care of Gracie. But what I can speak to is the craziness that gets in our hearts and our minds. And to settle ourselves down. I speak fluent caregiver. I speak yes, fluent you do. Caregiver. And and so when I when I work in Africa, we Gracie when she lost her legs, she wanted to start a prosthetic limb outreach. And so that's what we do. We do prosthetic limbs in in Ghana. Wow. When I go over there, they speak English, but it's a different kind of English. It's like Peter, we are so glad you are here. <laughs> Well, I understand the words, but it's, I have to work at making sure that we're understanding from the reference points and everything else. I can hear an American accent and my, you know, like this. Yeah, I can hear a Southern accent all the way across the airport. I mean, I can hear a y'all from 500 yards away when I'm over there. And, and so when I hear somebody speak in a way that I understand, I immediately turn and I'm, oh, I understand. Nobody knew what to say to me. They said words, but they didn't know how to speak to my heart. They didn't know the language that was down in here to speak to that. That's what I do. Yeah. And I and, have spent so much time in the village of caregivers that I speak it fluently. Well, and I I think it's even more rare, Peter, because you, um, in general, I don't think there's many male caregivers that have gotten that in tune with their emotions and how they're feeling and really and not being and just going for it. Like you're relentless about kind of unpacking all of the things that, that allow you to speak the fluent caregiver. So I, I appreciate you kind of also just being a guy and, and, well, and, I, I, and I, I don't have any other choice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I are one. You are uh, one. I, I, I get that. There aren't a lot of people. And I think part of that is though, Elizabeth, is that there's not a lot of people that know that it's okay to. Right. And and I think that's your job and my job is to help them understand that it's okay to. It's okay yeah. to unpack this and keep unpacking and go deeper and go deeper. You know, Schultz and Eason said this. He was in a Russian gulag for 27 years as a political dissident. And when he was free, he said, bless you prison for the change you made in my life. For there upon that rotting prison straw, I learned that the goal of existence is not prosperity, as we're told, but the maturity of the human soul. We're not going to stop unpacking. There's no need to. We can grow and we can grow and we can grow. But as long as we think that we are somehow imprisoned as caregivers, will never grow. It's when we realize that no prison, I'm not in prison in this. I'm not paying to Gracie. I'm tethered in the sense that I cannot go far from it. But within that tether, I chose to be extremely productive. And I want my fellow caregivers to do the same. I want them to understand the only thing holding you back truly is you, yeah. not your loved one's circumstances. You can, your mind is free. You are you are free to be as miserable or as joyful as you wish to be. And there will be days when you are swearing like Yosemite Sam. You know, that, <laughs> I've dated myself on that. And and I, you know, there are days when you're just cussing and fussing. I get it. But there, if you're willing to do this, there are days when you're going to see beauty and things of such preciousness and, and, and exquisiteness that it's going to enrapture your soul. Yeah. But you got to be willing to watch for it and look for it and wait for it 
and you got to be willing to go into some very dark places to see it. Yeah, it's like it literally is. I think two things can be true at the same time, right? Like you can you can have these really tough things happening and there can be some great joy in that. And I almost feel like the joy is even more vibrant because of the murk that it's all in. Like you're just, you are, you're kind of scaling through and you're like, whoa, look at that little amazing thing that happened or that thing that we can celebrate today. Um, it just shines brighter. I felt like the, the peaks of joy. I believe it does. I was out on horseback last fall before the snows came and <clears throat> I was not hunting, um, but I was just riding. And I, the trails I ride on out here are, are pretty obscure. There's, there's not a lot of people out here. And uh, people said, do you watch Yellowstone? I live it. Um, <laughs> I'm not saying we have a train station on the property. I'm not saying we don't. But <laughs> I was out riding, and I go up this trail and into the National Forest, and I cut over on a cow trail, and I was coming down, and I decided to go down into this ravine. And it's, you know, I'm looking at a 50-mile view over to Big Sky, and it's, and then I see, I see two spike elks. These are elks with just one point on their young ones. And then I heard a third one bugling. And I, I thought, I, I was stunned by the richness of the moment that I, I got to witness this on horseback, doing something mm -hmm. that, you know, how many guys want to be a cowboy, you know, kind of thing. Um, how many people want to be able to, to get out? You love nature, and here I am in this kind of thing. Nobody gets – I mean, it is so rare for these kinds of things compared to the amount of people in this world. And I just drank it every bit of it in, just good. drank it in. because And my soul – I came back, and Gracie said, you have a good ride? I was like, oh, yeah, <laughs> you know. And my soul was recharged. Yeah, I mean, you're tired after riding. You're dirty and everything else. It doesn't matter. I mean, I, I was just – I couldn't hardly contain myself because I saw something of beauty and I was going slow enough to be able to see it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I totally can understand what that, what that's like and, and feeling that. And I, and I hope that you're, I almost feel like if, if there was a church for caregiving, like you would be the preacher, um, Peter, because like I could listen to the stuff like the the story, you're a storyteller. You're you've got you know rich wisdom from your living in the trenches of care caregiving from failure. <laughs> yeah, I mean we're failing forward. It's okay. Like yeah, and and the writing. I think I know writing has was critical for me as a way to process it. So you know if someone's listening to this and you want to kind of try that on to see if that works for you. There's a lot of different ways that you can just kind of spill it out on the on the page even if it's even if you don't want to publish it like just for yourself um it's really uh, important i think to just kind of process i it. write it down exactly i got a buddy of mine who's a caregiver for his wife she just passed away last year and uh he, he does bonsai trees and he, they're, what is that? everything is just the little uh trees oh, they do oh, in the japanese garden yes and it's everything is intricate it's so tiny but it's so intricate, and it's what it does is just settles him down. And uh, and I thought, what a what a tremendous gift! I got another friend of mine who collects driftwood and makes little things out of it. And another buddy of mine who took care of his wife with Alzheimer's, he takes little pieces of wood that he finds and he carves these little birds to remind us of the scripture that says, "Consider the birds of the air that wow. they neither toil nor nor reap, but but your heavenly Father takes care of them. He, he's going to take care of you." You know, yeah. and it's just a little bird. He said, you put it in your pocket. I've got a bunch of them and I've given them around to people. He's given out hundreds of them just as a reminder to say, you know, it's going to be okay. Well, and it's and therapy you don't for have him to be miserable. To be yes, in the, very much there, so. There are things like that that keep you in the present moment. Like, um, I am a support caregiver for my brother who has an intellectual and developmental disability. My parents are deceased. And uh, Tom has got a passion for bingo. And I was kind of going to it just to, you know, spend time with him, you know, do things with him. But then I thought, you know what, darn it, I like bingo. And you know why I like bingo is because you can dab those things. And, but it forces hey, 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 you to be in the present. That's a gateway gambling drug. That's yes. a gateway gambling You're going to be in Vegas for it's all over. <laughs> yeah, but it, it forces you to be in the present because you're going to miss something. And so just to kind of stop all that like traffic in your head um, and the bonsai tree, like I could see, like you make a mistake, you're going to cut off the whole limb. Like you've got to, 
you got to pay attention there. That's that's important. That's why I don't do bingo, by the way, because I'll be in Vegas. If Mama needs a new pair of legs. Come on. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no. uh, it, but yeah, you're right. You have to you have to find that thing that for you and for for me, I, I have the I'm outdoors. I also am a pianist. I play. Uh, uh, I write. I enjoy cooking. Um, I I enjoy the drive. I like I listen to audio books. Uh, while I'm working, I, I've taken classes. I've taken I don't I'm, I don't know how many lectures now I've listened to. I'm studying theology. I am I took a class at Hillsdale College on C.S. Lewis. I'm a big C.S. Lewis fan. I'm doing all this on audio yeah. because I, I'm doing laundry and I'm doing all my tasks while I'm doing this, and because I refuse to stop pushing myself to learn and to grow. Yeah, that's intellectual self care. Yeah, for you. It is. And if people are going to take the time to read my books, and if they're going to take the time to listen to my program, then by God, I want to give them, I want to show them this is what I'm doing. Yeah. That I'm pushing myself. And my journey is relentless every day. Gracie's right now at full-time care. Like I said, two months in the hospital. We were there for Christmas. We were there for her for New Year's. We were there for her birthday. This is my life. But I'm not going to stop living, and I want my fellow caregivers to understand how important that is to, to keep pushing yourself, to learn, to grow, to appreciate things. It's not going to be everything that you want it to be, but if you sit around and wait for it to get better so that you can start living life, you're in for some real hurt on that yeah. point. Yeah, it's going to be potentially too late for sure. Uh, it's it's And I know for sure that you were writing your book, the, the latest one um, back in the... Um, Thanksgiving time frame because you, you were she had a huge surgery I know her and uh, you were working on it. talk us tell us a little bit more about the minute for caregivers when every day feels like Monday well, like I wrote that book she had her first big back surgery it was a nine hour surgery a year ago January uh, two years ago January, January so January 20 uh, 2022 and she was there for 10 weeks for that one. Oh wow and I wrote that book down the hall from her room I had a little spot once I would go down there and just take a break and I'd write, and, and her doctors and the PAs and all, they, they knew that was kind of my office. And there was a little concession area down there at the end of the seventh floor there. And I sat there at a table, and I wrote most of that book there or in her room. I yeah. got one of those little hospital uh, tables they do, they bring to you, you know, for your meals. I got one for myself, and I stood there at a standing desk on a hospital crate, and I wrote most of that book while I'm sitting there. There's one chapter I wrote called Quiet in the Room, where we learn to just keep the room quiet. Uh, uh, to settle ourselves down so that we can think. I wrote that in the ER uh, while they were doing something with her. And it, it was not a situation where she was in crisis, but you know, it, there was a lot going on. I brought my laptop. I knew we were going to be there for a while. So I'm literally right there beside her bed, beeping everything else. She's got to sleep a little bit, but they're still monitoring her. And I'm writing a, an article called Quiet the Room. And um, it, in the ER, if I don't lead by example as a caregiver, then I really don't have anything to say to people. Yeah. And the people that listen to me and read my stuff uh, recognize that that yeah, I've logged in the times. And and you know this is not theory to you or me, Elizabeth. This is how this is how we do it. This is how we've done it. Yeah. And how we're going to keep doing it. And I'm um, I'm okay with that. And being public about it, I think, helps hold us accountable as well. Like we've got that. Um, it's not pressure because I signed up for it. You signed up for it. And and but it's it's chosen accountability, I think, that um, and it, we have it, a responsibility, yes. a stewardship opportunity here again. That OK, what am I going to do with all this information I've amassed? All this experience, what am I going to do with it? Am I just going to just keep it all like here or can I share this with others so that they, too, can you know, go do their thing. There are yeah. songs that need to be written by caregivers. Mm. There are books that still need to be written by caregivers. There are all kinds of things that need to be done. And somebody's got to go to these individuals and say, like that lady said to me at a mental health hospital, I'd recommend a book for you to read, but you're the guy to write it. You are the guy to write so, it. You did write it. You've read, they're great. They're great books. Um, I love I love all of them. And I feel like after talking to you, Peter, like I know 
hopefully the conversation's energizing you too, but I feel like it's like a Rocky Conner moment, I call it, like Rocky Balboa, where you're in the corner, like a battered and bruised caregiver, and somebody's there kind of like, you've got this, you've got this, and they're putting the water in your mouth, and they're rubbing the sweat <laughs> off, and, and squeezing the shoulders, and like, get back out there, and I feel like when I listen and read your stuff, like, that's what that feels like for me, and and how do more people get to hear you? Like, we talk about your show, oh. too. Hope for the caregiver.com. Hope for the caregiver.com. And, uh, I, you know, I, I'm not a there, there kind of guy. I'm a, I'm a don't go down there kind of guy because I've been down there. That's a bad <laughs> place. Don't go down there. But I, I really want to point caregivers to something. I'm not here just to console people. I really want you to see that there is a world of opportunity and success and excitement and passion even while serving as a caregiver. Amen. And I'm yeah. saying that logging in now nearly 40 years of this. So, you know, you yes, don't you have can. to. Like, yes, yes, you can. Like, you, you can, can go this. on vacation. You can do this. You can do like, there's there's a will, there's a way type of thing. Um, that it is not about putting your life on hold. That doesn't, that's not a successful strategy for anybody um, to do that. And I'm Particularly just, with, with, with the technology, like what you're doing with me right here. The world is our oyster now. I mean, I'm in Montana. You're in Georgia. You know, I mean, we don't we're not limited by space and time anymore um, in the way that we used to be. Mm -hmm. And we can do things globally now. We should do that. You're doing it. I'm doing it. Why not somebody else? Yeah. And there's plenty of room for way more people to kind of join in because there's so many caregivers <laughs> that you and I can't you know, even begin to even help touch all of those lives. You you talk, um, I would switch the gears a little bit to self-care and um, before we kind of go through the lightning round of the self-care book, but you talk about how caregivers need to speak, speaking in first person singular. Like what is, can you expand on that? Like you share that that's <laughs> well, weird. Well, ask a caregiver, how are you doing? Well, we just got home from the hospital, or mama's doing okay, or our situation is this, or he's had a bad night. And I and I stop him and I say, no, I ask, how are you doing? And that's when the tears, that's when the stammering comes. And so I, I try to get caregivers to learn to speak from their own heart and do it slowly. It'll take a while. It, it takes getting used to. And um, I, I learned that at the piano uh, because I was, uh, Gracie's a no kidding singer. I mean, a really good singer. And, um, uh, don't don't take my word for it. Go go Google. Her. Listen, yeah. Uh, uh, and and she's done big stages, but when she kind of came off the stage for a while, and my pastor asked me to come play at church, and I've been playing since I was five. That's where we both formally studied music, and um, I'm up there. But I've been playing for her for a lifetime, so I'm hearing her voice in my head as I was playing the, the changes. I'm more of an improv player. And so I'm up there playing hymns in front of hundreds of people. This is, by the way, at the Covenant Church in Nashville where that shooting was. Mm. Um, that was our church. I'm sorry. And I'm yeah. up there playing. And um, I played for, I went back to Nashville to play for the funeral almost a year ago of Mike, uh, the janitor who was killed. He was the custodian there. And Mike used to sit there in the sanctuary and listen to me play while I practiced all the time. And, and um, but I was sitting there playing. And the pastor wanted me to play as people were coming in to kind of quiet the room down. There are hundreds of people there. And I wasn't playing the melody. I was playing and hearing Gracie's voice in my head. And so I'm playing around it, playing the harmonies. And there were great chords, but nobody knew what I was playing. And that was the longest 10 minutes of my musical career because I had to go back and remember to play the melody as I was playing of songs that I've been playing for a lifetime, but I was so used to playing it around Gracie. Mm. And I it, it, it locked me in to say, okay, I lost my melody. How many caregivers have lost their melody? And so one of the goals I have for myself and my fellow caregivers is help us to sing our own melody. We got it. It's there. It's going to take a little extra work, but we can do it. You can speak from your own voice. That's why I ask people when they call my program, how are you feeling? I'm not basing everything on our feelings, but I want to start that dialogue for you to start speaking from your heart. Yeah. Say what's on your mind. You know, and it, I don't care what comes after the word I. You say, oh, well, I'm pissed or I'm this or whatever. I don't care. Yeah. Now we as have a real conversation. Fine. fine is not a feeling. Yeah. Well, if they say I'm fine, I will usually say I'm not buying it. You want to go deeper? I mean, I'm, I, I will confidently and boldly, not brashly, go into really messy situations. 
mm-hmm. because I'm convinced of these principles. It's not my opinion. My opinion is irrelevant. I don't even care about my opinion. But these principles that I'm talking about, they are bedrock. And right now, when I talk to caregivers, I know the, one of the biggest needs they have is something solid to stand on so they can just breathe for a moment because everything feels like shifting sand on them. And so that's, that's what I do is just help them. We're going we're to speak from your heart. Mm-hmm. Just, what's going on with you? And I've got a caregiver support group that I started out here. And I have an eclectic group of people that come, and it's a great time just to sit around and just kick around the ideas. And we talk, but we, we, we all sit around a table with a cup of coffee and speak fluent caregiver to each other. And then we go back to our life. Yeah, well, nobody understands caregiving like another caregiver, which is why on my show, I only talk to family caregivers because they are the experts in family caregiving. Um, you can go to the other shows for the other the other experts, but that's indeed that's in, important to me to do that. What what is your self care like? What are some of your self care rituals look like that just kind of constantly keep you energized and refreshed so that you can like manage the you know the drama of the day. I do several things. One of them is uh, like coming on your program. This is this is um, energizing for me. Uh, I love to do it. I love to do my program. I love to be able to talk about this issue. Uh, I love to create, um, whether it's music or writing or whatever, um, cooking, those, those kind of things. I I also like to push myself intellectually. That's self-care for me because it keeps my mind sharp. That's why I take classes and and I have um, – I wear out Bluetooth earpieces. If you want to talk to me and, and, and I don't have an earpiece or I'm not in the car while my Bluetooth on my car, it's going to be a short conversation. I am not going to hold a phone to my head. Uh, I just won't do it. But I do like to uh, have robust – I got a tutor that's, that's worked with me. He's a retired. He's also a caregiver for his wife, and he's my theological tutor. And he pushes me, beats me over the head and, and things like that. I, I, I love that because this is keeping me sharp. It, yes, my body gets tired. And I, that's when sometimes I go out and just get on a snowmobile. And where I live, I wake up every day to a 50-mile view. No kidding. We live yeah. way up in the Rockies. And it's an extraordinary view. And I'll see deer and moose and you know elk and everything else. And, and that helps settle my soul. I, I I miss Nashville to a point. I mean, we don't have a Waffle House in the whole state. That's a problem. And Waffle House was a big part of my care routine. And, you know, and um, I miss that, but I don't miss the traffic. I don't miss the craziness. I, I was listening, watching a follow thing on social media. A friend of mine this morning, he's stuck on 75 trying to head out of Atlanta. And, you know, that I don't miss. No. Every day when you? I drive to town, I see antelope. You know, the deer and the antelope. Yeah, I see it all. I see pheasants. I see it all. Uh, a bald eagle. And uh, or I saw a golden eagle once. I've only seen them one time. And they're wow. massive. And so those are things that have kind of helped settle my spirit down and slow me down. I mean, I still work. I, I, don't, I don't have a, a sitting desk. I have a standing desk. I'm always working. Yeah. Um, we well, can't but change I think your that's type. that's part of your type. Your type A, probably I'm a type A. Like, we can't change our type. I've tried. Like it's just well, you are rest, who you are. Rest and sleep are two different things. Yeah. That's really important for us. To, I, I'd fall asleep at a moment's notice, but am I resting? Resting is knowing that it's going to be okay. I've, I, as a friend of mine said in the caregiver group the other day, his wife was asking him for the thousandth time that day the same question. Mm-hmm. And he said, in his heart, he spoke to himself and he said, he's got this. Just answer her question. And it was that he was resting and said, God's got this. Answer her question. It's okay. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. And I yeah. thought that's, that's my self-care of, it, of reminding myself of where solid ground is and standing there and not being in a hurry to leave it. Mm. So good. So good. Well, I got to, I got to ask you a couple, put you on the spot, Peter. Um, lightning you know, round. Lightning round. Here we go. You ready? This is prompts for my journal. <laughs> I'm ready. Because, uh, you know, people need to try on hopefully writing, and this is kind of a, a low entry point. Um, when's the last time you asked somebody for help? Uh, I asked this week. Uh, well, at the end of last week, I, I signed a contract with some people to come on board, 
and I just I spent the money to help me with a lot of technical stuff. And then I sent uh, I got another friend of mine who helped me with some accounting stuff. And I said, look, I've got to offload this. I I I, I can't do all this. And I need your help. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, in the last week. Constantly, kind of at my one of my little sub themes this year is say yes to less, and that's to again make more time for that. The well, I, I will steal that, Elizabeth. I'll give you credit for it, but I want to steal it. Steal it. Say yes to less. Oh, that's the best compliment. I love it. Yeah, say yes to less. Um, okay, so this one is like one of those monthly fun pages in my journal, but I pulled this one out for you because it says songs that make my heart sing. And I know you're a musical music lover. So when you need to just kind of like feel energized, like what what do you turn on? What are the song songs that make your heart I sing? I have several program places in my car on Sirius. Uh, I listen to the Sinatra channel because I love Frank Sinatra. And yes. who wouldn't? I don't, I don't want to be friends with people that don't like Frank Sinatra. <laughs> and uh, and I um, I listen to that. I've been listening to some, uh, some good uh, blues rock stuff that a friend of mine put me on to. I love the hymns. I love to play the hymns. I love hymns that are done well. And um, and then I I've got to tell you, when I turn on my wife's music, when I listen to her sing, and we've had a chance to record some some great stuff, and her voice, that voice, even in the hospital when she was singing, she was kind of croaky a little bit because she was dry, but she would, and I was just like, oh. And we sat there. I brought a keyboard into the uh, hospital room. Um, we had the best decorated room this year for Christmas. And I had a friend of mine let me borrow a keyboard and I set it over in the corner and I played and we played Christmas songs and she sang, you know, it was, you know, have yourself a Mary. And she's singing that from a hospital bed and I'm in the room and, and, and it was, it's Christmas Eve, Aww. some friends were there and it was spectacular. And I thought, I'm not going to stop playing music just because things are whatever. And so music is a huge part of my life and I, I love listening to it. That's amazing. And I, yeah. and I love the Doobie Brothers and Kenny Loggins and the Eagles too. <laughs> Those are all good. Those are all good, good picks. I, um, I'll have to send you, I have a caregiver anthem playlist that I like I, when I hear songs, I think about caregivers and I have compiled a playlist on Spotify and then uh, Pandora for you know, caregivers. Kelly Clarkson's What Does It Kill You Makes You Stronger. Stronger is a great, it's that probably on there. One of the that is one of the greatest songs. So it doesn't kill you, makes you strong. Yeah, so, I'm gonna send. I'm sending you the caregiver anthem playlist so that you can <laughs> on one of your next, uh, you know, walkabouts or um, it drives into your support group. You can check it out. Um, okay, what's something that you're currently praying for? You know, it's the same thing I pray all the time. Strength for today, bright hope for tomorrow. That is that is the go to pray uh, prayer for me. Strength for today, bright hope for tomorrow. That's it. it from Great Is Our Faithfulness. It's a great lyric uh, written by uh, Thomas Chisholm. And um, I, I think that um, clarity of thought, clarity of thought, because it's so easy to get disoriented as a caregiver when it's all coming at you. And I have to juggle a lot of plates um, and spend a lot of plates. And, and so I, I need that clarity of thought. I love that. And then um, it says list three things that you have feared and three things that have comforted you. But let's just take one. What's one thing that you feared and and one thing that you found comfort in? I think one of the things that I have feared is that um, something happens to me that incapacitates me from caring for her. Uh, I know I can't guarantee it because I mean I get on snowmobiles and horses and everything else, <laughs> but I try to be careful. I try not to get on roofs and do gutters. I ask people to help me do that. Ah. You know, I just I don't take I don't take stupid chances. I do I think the the risk for me is outweighed by the benefit for getting on a horse, for example. But you know those are things that I that that trouble me um, is that you know keeping myself engaged and healthy. Mm -hmm. Uh, to make sure because the responsibilities are significant on me. And so I don't want to drop that ball. Yeah, yeah. Makes sense. Makes sense. What are any parting words of wisdom, things that you wish we would have said that we didn't say? And then how do people stay in touch with you and find out more about your products? Well, you always go to hope for the caregiver.com or just Google me. Um, I, I think that I, I want to end with the, the phrase. I, I'm actually trademarking this phrase because I, I, it is the cornerstone of my life. Healthy caregivers make better caregivers. 
healthy caregivers make better caregivers. Not happy for, for me. I mean, because if sometimes we say we just want to be healthy. But I, know, I love how you said you got healthy and happy. You can't. How are you going to be happy if you're not healthy? Yeah, you can't. You know, and so we 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 chase happiness, but we do we chase healthiness? And I want to see your listeners listening to your program recognize that there's a dual thing. They have to just they can't just lock in on being happy because mm-hmm. happiness can be taken away from you. But healthiness belongs to you. You know, you could put down a, a, a milkshake and pick up water. You can, you know, not. Uh, do something that is going to create unhealthy to make a bad financial decision. You can stop that right now. I can't guarantee that I can be happy right at this moment, but I can guarantee that I will make a healthy decision. And if you chase healthy, happiness will chase you. Yeah. And I think, and so I, I want your listeners to embrace the fact that if you didn't put the happy caregiver, you put the happy, healthy caregiver, you know, together because healthiness is where, where I believe that is, that is our victory place. Because we're content in our mind and our spirit, and then all of a sudden we're going to discover, wow, I, I'm actually happy because I'm healthy, and and so you keep pounding that particular yeah, uh, and it's mental drum. health and physical health, like it's all of it. It's, it's, it's professional, mm-hmm. financial, it, grammatical. Social. No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but but all of the above because and those are decisions that are within our grasp right now. Some people think they can't be happy unless they're done with caregiving. Yeah. Or they get through this, and I say nay, nay, and you can, and you can start healthiness right now. Yeah. And part of that is just listening to this conversation with Elizabeth and me, the two two veteran caregivers who got a lot of scars and skin in the game, but but we're not. I, you know, Elizabeth, I look at you and I see your stuff. You're not miserable. You're not over there just crying in your beer, you know, kind of thing. No. Um, you're living life large. Why? Because you understand happy and healthy. And those are things that I want fellow caregivers to understand. Healthy caregivers make better caregivers. I love it. Peter, thank you so much for being here on, on the show. I hope this landed on folks that needed to hear it today. And I just really respect you know, your well, journey, your storytelling, your sense of humor, all of it. It's, it's well, You are so gracious to have me on. And I appreciate you very much. Thanks for your flexibility with my uh, impromptu studio set up here. But you're very gracious, Elizabeth, and I look forward to more times with you, okay? Thank you.